assalamu alaikum and good afternoon um, today as you can see we will be discussing some recent advances in treatment of hypertension and uh, there is presentation plus there are some case discussion too so over to you dr masood please uh, take over okay thank you so the way it will go today i will uh, present my presentation which will be a bit brief uh, i will finish in hopefully 25 to 30 minutes uh, because I'm more interested, I'm sure uh, you folks are also interested in case discussion. We all learn uh, more through that. So let me start my brief uh, presentation. So just to <clears throat> update the new uh, definition of high blood pressure uh, that is uh, recommended or approved by American Heart Association uh, a couple of years ago, actually more than that. So normal blood pressure is considered when systolic, for the safe, so sake of simplicity, I will keep a systolic blood pressure because that is more important than diastolic uh, or more commonly abnormal uh, than diastolic uh, blood pressure, particularly in elderly patient. So normal blood pressure is considered when systolic blood pressure less than 120. And when the systolic blood pressure is 120 to 129, that is called elevated blood pressure. And when it's between 130 to 139, that is high blood pressure stage one. When the systolic blood pressure goes more than 140, that is high blood pressure stage two. <clears throat> Obviously, we have to consider diastolic blood pressure also. That has been given over there. Uh, but systolic blood pressure, we commonly uh, target. And when blood pressure is more than 180, that is hypertension crisis. There are different terminology for that when it is accompanied by end organ damage, that is called uh, hypertension emergencies. When there is no end organ damage and blood pressure is high, it's called hypertension urgencies. But there's no specific number for blood pressure where you can call that. And commonly it's more than 180, it's like more than 200. Uh, particularly patients who have chronic history of uncontrolled hypertension for them, uh, the urgency or emergency is a bit higher number. So our current knowledge on hypertension has been thanks to so many trials over three, four decades. They are all uh, trials at different time, uh, but some trials <clears throat> are more important than others and that are landmark trials. Uh, these are a few of the landmark trials. Uh, DASH trial was 1997. This trial actually compared uh, the DASH diet uh, as compared to regular diet, the DASH diet was low sodium and more fruit and less unsaturated fat that showed there's some difference. Then there was an all heart trial in 2000, it was a big trial, which uh, compared different medication and the effectiveness and the effectiveness in controlling uh, end organ damage. And that uh, proved that the four first line medication, those medication are first line therapy for that reason, because those medications, including calcium blocker, uh, ACE inhibitor, ARBs, and thiazide diuretics are more effective than other medication in, uh, uh, in saving end organ damage. The one thing was particular that in that trial, uh, doxazosin, yeah, uh, alpha receptor blockers was uh, stopped earlier because it showed that that was leading to more risk for uh, congestive heart failure as a solo drug, but it can be uh, included with other medication if need to be. Then there was a HIV trial that actually trial which, which showed that even patients with very elderly, which are definition wise, uh, 80 years or older, even they have significant benefit from controlling blood pressure. And then there was a accomplished trial in 2008, which compared uh, calcium channel blocker with ACE inhibitor combination compared to <clears throat> uh, ACE inhibitor and hydroprothiazide combination. And it showed that the in controlling stroke and other, there's slight advantage of uh, combination of ACE inhibitor with calcium channel blocker. The only uh, criticism on that uh, trial was that 
in that the hydrochlorothiazide that we use as compared to other trials where they used long acting uh, thiazide like diuretics like uh, indepamide and chlorothalidone. And there was a, a cold trial in 2010, which uh, including a patient with diabetics, and that compared the systolic blood pressure of target of 140 to 120, and that did not show much difference between the primary goal and then the biggest trial so far and the most important one, SPRINT trial in 2015, which again compared uh, systolic blood pressure goal uh, less than 140 to 120, and that showed that there are much benefit in all the primary endpoint. <clears throat> And that actually led to AHA with giving the recent recommendation regarding blood pressure control and target. So this is our target blood pressure, which is recommended by uh, AHA. But again, it's uh, always debatable and it's not like it's just a guideline. And uh, basically you have to individualize the patient to what is best uh, target blood pressure for that patient. So if you see that, <clears throat> All patient, the recommended uh, target systolic blood pressure is 130, except patient who are secondary stroke prevention. And they are secondary stroke prevention patient with the history of stroke, their uh, target blood pressure or where they went to start is actually is uh, 140. So uh, secondary prevention patients need to start medication on one, more than 140. And if patient has <clears throat> uh, no risk or less than 10% risk for coronary vascular disease, in that patient, even blood pressure between 130 and 140 can be monitored with lifestyle changes. So basic principle of uh, controlling blood pressure, uh, basically it's important to control blood pressure on whatever medication it takes. Although uh, some medication are preferred, uh, because of their record for uh, controlling or saving any organ damage. So these are the medication which are medication for first line therapy, uh, calcium channel blocker, uh, dihydropidine, uh, like amlodipine and afedipine, not the non dihydropine like verapamilocardisam, then ACE inhibitor and ARBs, and then thiazide diuretics. But what is the specific of special specialty of these medication, which made them the first line therapy medication. Because they reduce all cause mor morbidity and mortality as compared to other medication and these medication reduce central blood pressure. As you can see, central blood pressure, we don't use that blood pressure monitor monitoring in uh, practice, uh, but in uh, studies, uh, in research studies, center blood pressure is uh, monitored. And most likely in future, I don't know how many years will take that we'll be measuring center blood pressure, not the peripheral blood pressure. <clears throat> and it showed then these four medication uh, control the cent central blood pressure better. If you see this chart, uh, ACE inhibitor, ARBs, calcium channel blocker, to some extent the diuretics also decrease the center blood pressure. If you see the beta blocker, they do not reduce the center blood pressure. Actually, they increase the center blood pressure. Hence, uh, blood beta blockers are not the first line therapy medication for blood pressure. It can add it when needed, or if there's specific need for that patient, like a, a secondary prevention of coronary artery disease. Otherwise, they are not the first line therapy medications. Uh, but there is more to for that topic. I'll talk about a little bit later some newer medication beta blockers. Uh, could be studied as first-line therapy, potentially, not officially yet. <clears throat> so again, this is the, uh, you can see that <clears throat> all the first-line therapy medication, they reduce central blood pressure, beta blockers increase central blood pressure. So most commonly used medication for blood pressure is calcium channel blocker. Uh, the best thing is that the one we use, they are long acting. They reduce the daily variability of blood pressure, which is the important factor in reducing the uh, stroke uh, risk for that, and also other risk for end organ damage. And they are metabolically neutral 
has no effect on glucose intolerance effect or lipid parameters. But my, one problem we commonly see with those medication, uh, vasodilator you know, medication cause edema. Uh, because, uh, let me go to the next slide, which explained why and how to prevent that. So if you see that, there's a arterial dilation that happens with when you give calcium channel blocker, vasodilator, but there's no venodilator. So when the more blood flows to the arterioles with dilation, there's actually because of increased renin there's a veno constriction to some extent, and there's more pressure here, and the fluid or plasma fluid actually feel through uh, here and cause interstitial edema. That is the cause of edema, which we frequently see with the amlodipine and nifedipine, <clears throat> and also with other medication, also like uh, idolazine, or if you use any time minoxidil, same thing. And how to prevent that? So this is a hypertension. Here you give calcium chain blocker. They were explained that it increase the dilatory uh, vasodilation. Uh, with the increased renin, there's a more reduction, actually uh, more vasoconstriction at veno vasoconstriction. But if you combine with RES inhibitors, like uh, ARBs or calcium chain blocker, sorry, ARBs or uh, ACE inhibitor, it increases the, it decreases the renin level. So it they cause the veno dilation also. So there will not be any interstitial edema. I mean, I won't say it will not be, which help in reducing that. So that's the one way of trying to reduce the uh, edema caused by calcium chain blocker by combining it with the ARBs or ACE inhibitor. Uh, now some discussion on the uh, thiazide diuretics. Basically, there are three commonly used thiazide diuretics. One is hydrochlorothiazide, that is thiazide diuretics, and chlorothalidone and indepamide. Basically, these two technically are thiazide-like diuretics, not exactly thiazide. I don't have to go into detail about that. Uh, I use most of the time when I can chlorothalidone and indepamide. Indepamide more than any other out of these three. The reason being Hydrochlorothiazide is the short acting. It has to be given twice a day to be effective. Chlorothalidone is very long half-life and endepamide, same thing. They need to be given, can be given once a day. And that is one factor that make these two medications more effective to control blood pressure. All the trials, uh, blood pressure trials, except maybe one, uh, use chlorothalidone and endepamide. Actually, one trial they started with hydrochlorothiazide. Actually, they stopped the trial in between and changed to uh, chlorothalidone. So this is very important then you, I mean, I'm just asking here, in Pakistan, indepamide and chlorothalidone is available? Chlorothalidone is not available, but It is available, is not? Indepamide. It is available, huh? Yes, chlorothalidone is not available. Okay, actually I use indepamide more commonly. The reason being that here in US, chlorothalidone is not available less than 25 milligram dose. I don't know why. And most of the time it's a bit too much. Uh, so indepamide comes in uh, 1.25 and 2.5 and good dose. So uh, I use that more often. There's a there's a preparation of uh, chlorothalidone called thalatone, which is a not a generic, but it is available in a fifteen milligram strength. So, okay, that's that's a good dose. So, how come a thiazide diuretic uh, cause uh, more effective blood pressure control as compared to loop diuretics, which are loop diuretics are more powerful diuretics? So the reason being that uh, thiazide diuretics decrease the total blood flow resistance, so it causes vasodilation. Uh, nobody pin, can pinpoint exactly what exactly the mechanism, but different proposed mechanisms are all these. So bottom line is that uh, after a few weeks, uh, thiazide diuretics called vasodilation also. That's why the thiazide diuretics, which are not the case with the loop diuretics, 
and that's why the Thaizai diuretics are considered to be anti-hepatitis medication, not the loop diuretics. Uh, one important thing is to remember here, when you're using Thaizai diuretics solely as blood pressure medication, uh, it does not matter whether you do low dose or high dose. Actually, high dose is not more effective than low dose. And the reason being that higher dose you give, the increase renin uh, level, and that actually uh, counter the effect of vasodilation and it's called vasoconstriction, so it is not effective. So low dose is same effectiveness as high dose in case of thiazide diuretics. But <clears throat> when you combine this <clears throat> with an ACE inhibitor or ARBs, uh, those medications like ARBs or ACE inhibitor, they will reduce or they uh, will work on uh, high ACE inhibitor uh, renin level. In that case, you can increase the dose of thiazide diuretics in combination with ARBs and ACE inhibitors, then increased dose will be more effective than small dose. Uh, just a practical point. So there has been many meta-analysis, they have been meta-analysis comparing thiazide with thiazide diuretics, uh, which all showed that uh, the favorable thiazide medication is thiazide like uh, diuretics like uh, uh, endepamide and clothalidone, and not the thiazide. Just to make a point, there's a very recent study within the past, I think, month that has come out, which shows that HCTZ and clothalidone are actually equivalent. So there's some conflicting data on that now. Yeah, but uh, we have to compare that to how many trials they uh, actually showed that right. yeah. so maybe one small right. child could always come but so far general uh, it's not even a controversial point that uh, the long acting clothalidone and if I, at this point are the thiazide diuretics of choice as compared to uh, hydrochlorothiazide but good point so that's the reason uh, that you look at the blood pressure variability and control with the long acting thiazide diuretics as compared to hydrochlorothiazide is it short acting? So this is a, another important topic, the beta blocker role in blood pressure. We have first generation with non-selective uh, propranolol, which is really used for blood pressure now. Then we had the second generation beta one selective, which we commonly use uh, like metoprolol and tenolol. Uh, those medication had shown uh, not to be used at least in USA, uh, not comparing in uh, uh, Europe, uh, we don't use that as a first line therapy, unless there's another indication like a secondary prevention of cornea disease, because this medication increases central blood pressure and do not decrease the risk for stroke. And then we have a third generation uh, beta blockers, which are vasodilator beta blockers, uh, mainly carbidolol and nebulinol. These medication are very effective blood pressure medication because of their uh, property of vasodilation. But the mechanism of causing vasodilation is different in these two. So these are the beta blockers effect. So some beta blockers have alpha-1 antagonism. That's why it's caused vasodilation. vasodilation. Like carbidolol has this effect also, uh, along with uh, beta antagonist. Then some beta-1 selective, they call decrease chronotropic, decrease uh, inotropic, and uh, so that's why you call cause low blood pressure. And then we have beta two agonists, which are non-specific, but it has some unwanted side effects, particularly uh, bronchoconstriction, and it's not good for a patient who has history of asthma or even COPD and some unwanted effect on insulin metabolism. Then we have nebevolol, which is basically also work as B3 agonist. And that is the, this causes this medication very, very uh, exciting prospect for uh, as blood pressure medication. Hopefully we'll have more use of this medication uh, indication. And also my feeling is that this will also be labeled as uh, first line therapy medication because increase in nitric oxide release at, at the endothelial level, which causes vasodilation. It has antioxidant effect and increased lipolysis. 
it has negative effect on, I said, no bad effect on diabetes or lipid profile. So it works in two ways in the bevel oil, uh, alpha adrogenic receptor uh, agonist, antagonist, uh, work at heart level, decrease heart rate, decrease myocardial contactability, and at endothelial level, increase nitric oxide release through beta-3 agonism and decrease peripheral vascular resistance. So that's why medication is working different than carbidolol, but it causes vasodilation also. It's a very effective medication as blood pressure medication with all the benefit uh, regarding more study from CKD, uh, from cornea disease, even with CHF. Uh, and one of the only two class of medication which does not cause erectile dysfunction along with S inhibitor and ARBs. So <clears throat> beta blocker, nebevalol is the preferred uh, beta blocker for blood pressure, followed by carbidolol. Okay, so strategy for starting the blood pressure. So if you have stage one blood pressure, like blood pressure between 130 to 139 in a patient, but if he or she has less than 10% risk for 10 years cornea disease, then medication not need to be started. Uh, has to be followed every six months or so and advice low salt diet, lifestyle uh, uh, improvement, like exercise and improve the weight. But if that patient with stage one hypertension has uh, CVS risk or for 10 years more than 10%, and then those patients need to be started on blood pressure medication, can start monotherapy like S inhibitor, ARBs, or thiazide diuretics also. But patient in st uh, stage two, uh, with blood pressure more than 140 to 190. And those patients most of the time better off uh, starting the dual therapy, combination of S inhibitor and calcium channel blocker as the first choice, or you can start with any of the two of the uh, three of these medications. Same thing, monotherapy, uh, pick any of the threes. Uh, when combination uh, started, you can pick up the ARBs and S inhibitor. Uh, and calcium channel blocker, and preferably if you find a combo or to one tablet contains both, that's preferable to improve the compliance. And if a third medication needed, then you add thiazide diuretics. So resistant hypertension, when you patient taking all three first line therapy medication blood pressure is still not controlling target, that is called resistant hypertension. Uh, and that definitely include thiazide diuretics. Or blood pressure needs four medication to control blood pressure, that is called resistant hypertension. So what medication need to be added? I mean, uh, now uh, uh, preferred medication, when you need to add fourth medication, nebevalol is a good choice, carbidolol and uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Until now, the next uh, the recommendation was mineral corticoid receptor antagonists like a spirolectone and ethylerone. Um, but I think now the nebevalol is coming out as the preferred choice ahead of uh, MRA. So these are potassium draining diuretics, very good medication to add for people who have resistant hypertension, uh, spirolectone, ethylerone, and amiloride. So with these medication, uh, spironolactone is uh, more effective than epinolone uh, milligram to milligram basis, but has more side effects because the uh, non-specific is caused more gynecomastia or anti-androgen effect. Epinolone causes less, is, is, uh, but higher dose. If you're starting with 25 milligram of spironolactone, you need to give 50 milligram of epinolone. And if patient cannot tolerate uh, any of them, then amyloroid is uh, not a bad choice, which will not any anti-androgen side effects. So these are all the trials study that show that how the added medication for resistant hypertension, spirolectone was more effective than doxorosin and beta blockers. And particularly when they give it a higher dose, it was even more effective. So it's a good medication the patient can tolerate and you can handle any side effects potential like a hyperkalemia is the most common one. And if still patient needs an added fifth medication, then doxazosin is a bad idea. 
Uh, I don't know how often you guys use a, a dual calcium channel blocker. That's always sometimes comes patient has uh, AFA, patient already on Cardizem, and you already given S inhibitor, already given thiazide diuretics, blood pressure is still uh, not controlled, and you're wondering, uh, can I add uh, nephritopine or minoridopine? Uh, I think there is no contraindication in that. We just have no experience. Uh, there has been, I looked at a meta-analysis which showed that uh, there is, they are safe to be used and effective. And you see the side effects uh, profile, there is no increased side effects. Uh, actually, the only one thing that when they use uh, non dihydropyridine uh, medication like verapamilocardizem that cause more constipation, when they add calcium channel blocker like amlodipine, the constipation was slightly less. So bottom line is that this is safe to add to treat patient with a dual calcium channel blocker when it's needed. Uh, then we have uh, a newer uh, medication like SGLD2 inhibitors and uh, phenylalanine, which is a non-steroidal uh, MRA. Uh, these medication primarily not a blood pressure medication, but they do have effect on blood pressure. So keep in mind uh, when adding this medication, one patient is already on blood pressure, blood pressure medication, although their effect is uh, not very drastic, but it has significant effect on blood pressure. There has been uh, like some side study or trial like a, a depaglyphosine 10 milligram. It showed that in a trial uh, initially that it decreased the blood pressure compared to placebo. Similarly, another uh, canangliflozine also showed that it decreased the blood pressure and the other studies of uh, Um So it's basically uh, not uh, restricted to one kind of uh, canangliflozine, all have same effects. So just keep in mind. And then we have this new medication uh, with non steroidal MRA. Uh, Filiron, it also showed that it has, in fact, actually, they showed that in resistant hypertension, it has effect in, a, uh, from, I mean, in control of blood pressure. Uh, again, the effect is uh, not as strong as uh, a spirolactone, uh, but again, uh, you can give higher dose because it has less tendency to cause hyperkemia and side effects. And similarly, Entresto uh, <clears throat> uh, or uh, uh, Sacributus and Valsart in combination, this is a very effective blood pressure medication, although uh, it's expensive and uh, it has specific indication for congestive heart failure with reduced uh, uh, or ejection fraction, uh, and in some cases with the preserved ejection fraction, but again, when they compared with and this one with other ARBs that has more effective blood pressure control. Actually in China, it recently approved as blood pressure medication. So patients don't have to have congestive heart failure to take this, it's very effective blood pressure. So when you are giving this patient or patient all this medication, uh, sacrobutyl and all certain combination, uh, it's a very effective blood pressure control. And some studies show that it does affect, obviously with, because of inclusion of ARBs has some effect on prevention of uh, or progress, prevention of progression of CKD and protein urea. So um, this is, I would like to emphasize, uh, we use some medication very commonly, which you not use. I, my most uh, unlikely uh, medication is hydalazine. A uh, couple of things about hydalazine why this medication has never been included as a first line, second line, or even third line therapy for blood pressure. First of all, it's a, had a, a tachyphylaxis effect. That means that after a few weeks, it effect is uh, reduced and you need higher higher dose to be effective. Uh, second thing is that it in higher dose, particularly if you use more than 150 milligram a day, high risk for uh, drug induced to, uh, I mean, toxicity like uh, drug induced lupus, and also drug induced vasculitis. And it's a short acting. Uh, you have to give three or four times a day to be effective. So uh, very few indication when you need hydralazine to be added and it doesn't work anyway. And similarly, uh, 
uh, cardio selective beta blockers like metoprolol or tenolol. Uh, these medication are not a blood pressure medication. Uh, if you have to give beta blocker, uh, to give vasodilator beta blockers like carvedilol and nebulol. Uh, clonidine, we all know that it's not a good medication, very short acting, has a rebound hypertension and cause a lot of side effects like dry mouth, depression most of the time. So in, when we have a choice of so many medication available, uh, I don't know why you use uh, clonidine, um, but still use more often than it should be used. And in alpha blocker receptors, blocker hydrine are a bit short acting. If you knew, use that, uh, use long acting, which is a doxyzosin. So a new medication, which actually this was presented uh, in Chicago, the, uh, the cardiology uh, conference, in November 7th, and the same day, this was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a new medication called Vexostat. Uh, stage two trial showed that it uh, is effective in blood pressure and in future it will be available. It's basically is uh, uh, block the aldosterone synthase. Uh, so it'll decrease the production of function of aldosterone. And the benefit is that it has a very tolerability, much less side effects. Even hyperkalemia was only two patients out of 300 patients they, uh, they checked. And on those two patients, hyperkalemia did not improve and they discontinued. So they claim that uh, this medication has a very low level of side effects and they're very effective in uh, resistant hypertension when you add two patients already on three blood pressure medication. So this is a, a different level dose, the blood pressure effect. Consume this systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Same thing. And they compared with another medication which is coming also, uh, aprostitran. This is basically a dual endothelial receptor, endothelian receptor antagonist. So this is also becoming, uh, I think, stage two trials already done. Uh, so this will be two new medication will be and I don't know how long it would take, a year or two, but these medication will be another choice to control, particularly patient with resistant hypertension. Uh, another one, they're trying a, a patient here in Queens Valley University, uh, one injection every six months that actually will control the blood pressure, uh, like they're targeting angiotensin receptors, but I don't know how long that would take or how effective that would be. Not much studies that published yet on that. So one quick thing on a uh, blood pressure control in a dialysis patient, uh, they are a bit different. They are, uh, they are more uh, sympathetic, uh, sympathetic uh, drived hypertension. So beta blockers are most effective blood pressure medication in that. So carbidolol and nebulol should be preferred uh, after the amlodipine and ARBs um, also, but this is the preferred medication. So very important that beta blockers are very effective for patient on dialysis. This is important thing that you have to be aware of the dialyzability of the medication blood pressure. You can see that when you give metoprolol or etanolol after dialysis, all washed out. So, but carvedilol is very little, little dialyzed and simply uh, finding with the, uh, don't have much finding, but the, the uh, uh, reportedly, uh, nebulol also uh, doesn't need any do dose adjustment. Same thing again, that can all, almost 70, 80% dialyzed after one session, metoprolol. But one thing is that tenolol, uh, if you have a patient who is non-compliant, patient are poor, they cannot, uh, don't want to take or cannot take. A tenolol is very effective in controlling blood pressure in a dialysis patient if you give three times a week after dialysis. So that's uh, one good way of using a tenolol as blood pressure medication. But generally, if you have available other medication and patient is compliant, um, there's no role of uh, a tenolol and metoprolol. So what I'm is that uh, mainly you have to control blood pressure, whatever it takes, that's important. Uh, obviously patient has to be tolerated that. So this is a, one of my patient, uh, 52 year female, I don't want to make, but anyway, she has gone through all uh, secondary workup, all negative blood pressure has not been controlled, went to a different uh, center also. Now my patient for the last 10 years and this medication she's on, just imagine. 
any medication you think she's not on. But blood pressure control, uh, kidney function stable, actually had creatinine slightly high, 1.3, 1.4 level 10 years ago, but now it's less than one. Uh, no protein urea, but doing fine. So bottom line, sometimes you, this is a refractory hypertension. Uh, whatever it takes, you need to control blood pressure. So hope I didn't take much time. I would like to discuss cases and any comments or case presentation. Uh, please go ahead. So yes, I think there's a little bit of art to treating hypertension and there's some science to it. What makes you choose one first line agent over another when you're taking a look at patients? Obviously a 30 year old starting therapy for hypertension is very different from a 50 year old. That's very different from a 70 year old. So what are the things that you look at the patient's phenotype and profile and say, this person I'm gonna treat with this medicine and that person I'm gonna treat with that? Very important question. Actually, every blood pressure you see, you have to find out that what most likely cause of hypertension, what is the mechanism causing high blood pressure in this patient? Because a different uh, like uh, uh, racial difference, there's a, uh, there's a age difference. So blood pressure caused by either sympathetic over discharge or because increased renin or angiotensin level in the patients like, okay. Or patient has decreased uh, uh, vasodilation. So patients who are younger patients, like 30 year old, as you described, they have uh, like, like high renin uh, patient most of the time, okay? They're not typically called salt sensitive, they're salt insensitive. So basically, uh, so those patients, uh, ACE inhibitor, ARBs are very effective because they have high renin level uh, patient. Compared to an elderly patient, like 70 year old, those are compared as low renin or salt sensitive. Uh, patient who has uh, decreased capability or compliance is low, and also they have a decreased uh, level of uh, uh, vasodilation. Those patients has will be more effective in uh, thiazide diuretics or calcium channel blocker. So again, there's a racial difference. Uh, like uh, African American, they are more salt sensitive. That means they have low renin level. They will not be very effective as blood pressure concern on ACE inhibitor ARBs. For them, more effective is calcium channel blocker and thiazide diuretics. My second question is about sodium potassium blockers, aldectone and, and trimetrine, et cetera. Do you think they're underutilized and utilized rate late the way we treat hypertension today? Yes, I think so, uh, absolutely. Because most of the resistant hypertension, if you see in details, they basically are salt retention, okay? They don't get enough, uh, they don't get enough diuretics. Uh, that's the one reason that their blood pressure is not well controlled. And uh, uh, because of the other thing that hypokalemia uh, by itself cause resistance to treatment for hypertension, okay? And if you give a patient a thiazide diuretics and his or her potassium is uh, three, okay? And you give a 25 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide and blood pressure is not good. So rather than increase the dose or increase another blood pressure medication, if you just give potassium and improve the potassium from three to four, the blood pressure will be much better. So that's why the, uh, the potassium sparing, uh, uh, potassium sparing uh, medications, diuretics are very effective, but less used. Um, at the same time, um, many patients who are resistant hypertension, they have high level of uh, renin level uh, uh, compared to some population like a patient who have sleep apnea or some obese patient. Uh, so those patients are very effectively treated with uh, those medications, potassium sparing. You're right, they're underutilized. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Dr. Masood. I think we have a case from uh, Dr. Aliyah, sir. So, um, should we go to case or if there are any other questions, we can take those questions as well. I think if you unshare your screen, um, he may be able to share his.
Is it working for you? Can, can you hear me? Yes, now we can, Ali. Now we can hear okay. you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this uh, chance to present this very difficult uh, to treat uh, or a resistant hypertension in a, an adolescent child. Um, so she is 14 years old now. And uh, her illness started when about five years ago when she was nine years of age and she presented with uh, non-bloody diarrhea and temporary loss of vision with a history of fever. It was diagnosed to have an infection induced HUS uh, and hypertensive encephalopathy. She required three sessions of dialysis and IV labetalol initially and it all got better she recovered her renal functions completely and uh, was, her blood pressures were also uh, about, I, I think they were like uh, well controlled with very low doses of uh, just an amlodipine and maybe a little bit of uh, inalumbrin. She first presented to us one year after uh, this episode and uh, at that time, uh, she had a, a shrunken right kidney and uh, she had small sub-centimeter stones in both her kidneys that were non, uh, not obstructing and her creatinine was 1.05. The estimated GFR was around 58. So the blood pressure at that time was like 136 by 82 on a low dose of amlodipine and uh, captopril. So we did a workup for her stone and we found that uh, she had a poorly functioning right kidney which evidently had scars and she had hypocitruturia, hyperuricosuria and her uh, 24 hour urine protein excretion was about uh, was 285 milligrams less than 300. So um, her BP remained high and uh, we kept on increasing the doses of amlodipine first, we maximized it, then we increased, changed the captopril to enalapril for once daily dosing and maximized it. And then we added atenolol, but her uh, blood pressure kept on increasing and uh, home readings and at, uh, in, in the clinic, blood pressures were always 160 over 110 range and um, she kept on complaining of headaches. So then we added uh, Losartan to uh, the third one. And then uh, after that, we added uh, Diltiazem and then Clonidine, but her blood pressures kept on increasing. However, her creatinine remained at around 1.1. So we did other workups for her end organ damage or any other secondary cause of high blood pressure. Her uh, echo showed that uh, her systolic and diastolic functions were preserved. There was a little evidence of some mild concentric modeling. Um, CT angiogram was unremarkable. So were her, all her blood sugars, thyroid profiles, lipid profiles, and her fundus. Um, Renin was high because she was on ACE inhibitor and uh, aldosterone was normal. So we thought that the cause of her blood pressure is uh, um, are the scars in her right kidney. And um, that's why uh, we thought that now it had been almost a year that we had kept on adding all these medications. And at that time, when we decided to do a nephrectomy, she was already on enalapril, losartan, etinolol, clonidine, thiazide, minoxidil, and diltiazem. And her BPs with all these medications were still on a, for her percentiles, it was still above 90th percentile. So we went ahead and, and her creatinine was normal, was at the same level. So we thought we should uh, preserve her uh, kidney function by you know, removing that scarred kidney. And we went ahead and we did a laparoscopic nephrectomy. 
post operatively for one week we were very happy her blood pressures had gone down to 100 over 60 and we kept on stopping all the medications one by one and then we she remained off medications only for a week after a week her blood pressure kept on increasing again and uh, then over next six months, all those medications that were there were added one after another, and we kept on maximizing the doses. We even tried Nebivalol and Prezosin, and uh, all of them were given for good at least three months each, um, and uh, the BP never got control. And then after all these months, uh, six, eight months, her creatinine started increasing now to 1.7 and currently it's around 2.3. Um, we have added a new department in uh, SIUT, a pediatric cardiology team, and they came in with all the new equipments and the new knowledge and uh, a more aggressive approach. So we went ahead and did an ambulatory BP measurement on her. And this is how it showed. Um, as you can see that her blood pressures were always above, systolic blood pressures were always above, uh, uh, around higher than 160, it kept on shooting. But um, one significant thing that was noted was that, that when her blood pressures were at the highest range, her pulse rate was not so high. So at this, we had, uh, these were the summary of the ABP readings. So after we had tried all the uh, ARNIs, and uh, the SGLT and metoprolol by the cardiologist, uh, blood pressures still are on a very high side. And with the, after that ABP uh, uh, monitoring, um, last month she came to us with a severe headache, worst headache of her life, the blood pressure of 210 over 130. So we got her in an ICU, uh, her uh, CT scan showed cerebral edema. We placed an art line, gave her IV labetalol and brought this down. Her symptoms improved slightly, but the blood pressures always remained, never went below 160 or 110, even with IV labetalol. So now we have also added Lasix mm -hmm. because her renal functions are uh, decreasing and she's not making enough urine with the thiazides or any other diuretics and I hope that it is a vasodilatory type of hypertension and then it will give her more diuretics then maybe her blood pressure would decrease a little bit but uh, in her last follow-up the blood pressure was still 160 over 110 range. So this is just a small graphic representation of her blood pressures uh, never improved even after nephrectomy and uh, the EGFR continues to fall. So, any thoughts or any other recommendations, any other thing that we can do for her? No, that's a quite a challenging case. Uh, and you said, how young is the patient? Because we missed, we couldn't see your very first slide. Oh, uh, she's 14 years old now. 14, okay. And, and the hormones, the renin and aldo and metanephrines, do we have read Renin, renin were, uh, they were checked after she was uh, taking uh, ACE inhibitors. So it was around 300 range. Aldosterone was, uh, I don't remember exactly the value, but it was within normal range. Um, what, was, what was the what was the uh, units of the renin activity, uh, Ali? Uh, Dr. Fan, I'm sorry, I I don't really remember that. Uh, but this is high, right? Very. I mean, it, it for, for, a, for, an, yeah, for a nanogram per ml per hour, this is astronomically high renin activity. Yeah, I, I hope this is a different unit. I never saw more than seven or eight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this would be astronomically high. 
maybe a different unit, maybe, I think so. But yeah, still, it's, uh, different. it's out of range, right? Definitely. Mm. Um, yes, it was like, if I remember correctly, it was like 30 or 40 times the higher, oh, uh, the upper limit. Hmm. Okay. And, and but was uh, we did not pay much heed to it because we thought that uh, this renin could be due to the uh, high ACE inhibitors. And what was the aldosterone number, the value? I'm sorry, say it again. What was the aldosterone value that the test? Uh, that is one value that I did not find in the chart. It was just written there that it's within normal limits. Uh, I think Sabita is also there in the audience. Sabita, do you remember the uh, value of aldosterone? She just left. Oh, Ishad, maybe? I think this is a, somehow less important because if renin is high, so uh, it somehow matter less that how high the aldosterone level because uh, aldosterone could be high, but it could be secondary to very high renin level. Uh, but definitely it's like to see that how high the aldosterone level. So basically it does uh, exclude the primary hyperaldosteronism at least. Yes, um, and the electrolytes have always remained normal. So, we, uh, and the, uh, on all, all her imagings, the uh, adrenals look okay, and uh, there were no other symptoms other than headache with the, these blood pressures. It was never any, um, you know, these episodic kind of things that would uh, make us doubt that. Really, I don't remember um, number of um, aldosterone, though unit of renin was uh, picogram per ml. Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. Do, you, do you remember the value? Value of renin? Yes, the renin was around 85. 85 picograms? Yes. Okay, and per aldosterone? Ml. Aldosterone, I don't remember that number. Okay. Yeah, it was because the, her file was so thick with all the ICU admissions and all. So I did not find that where so, we didn't get it done at our lab. So the report must have been misplaced. So you have any idea that what is your labs in normal range are uh, random wise? Because it's still like a, almost, if you go by our, I mean, units is unbelievable. I have never seen anything like this uh yeah no no it's not actually elevated because uh you know 83 picograms would be like 0, 0.0 i just i was just looking at a calculator so it's like 0 0.08 nanograms so i think there's a difference of a thousand or something so if we convert it into nine nanograms the the units that you and i are familiar with uh, then it probably is not that elevated i'm thinking like uh, close to normal or a little bit higher? Yeah, yeah, I mean, 83 picograms are equal to 0 0.08 nanograms. So if if we just do a, if we assume that this is picogram per ml per hour, then if we convert it into nanogram per ml per hour, it should be 0 0.083 nanogram per ml per hour. So that is that's actually pretty suppressed. It is. Hmm. So I think that then knowing the aldo level is important. It's very important. Knowing metanephrines uh, uh, might might be also valuable to see if we have the catecholamines level done as well. But knowing aldo level is is still important because it looks like there is there must be some sort of a monogenic uh, hormonal type of hypertension. Or if but, would you not uh, expect uh, other electrolyte abnormalities with them? Not necessarily, not necessarily. I yeah. mean, this is this is a common, but not always. Actually, a patient with hyperaldosteronism, uh, less than fifty percent has. A, I mean, this patient probably, if that's weird, less than fifty percent has a hypokalemia. Yeah, everything is off the chart here for the presentation. You know, this is very severe, extreme forms of presentation, and and you have done so much already. It's just like. Does this patient has any family history of hypertension? 
Her father has uh, some primary hypertension, which is controlled with medication. But you said this started after she had HUS, right? Right. Okay. Oh, there is HUS history too? Oh, yeah. That's what yes. Uh, that's at what the I'm age thinking. of nine years, that was her first presentation. Previously, a healthy child, growing well, just went in with an infection-induced HUS with the low uh, fragmentation, low platelets, uh, renal failure requiring three sessions of dialysis and temporary vision loss with very high blood pressures. And that was treated with dialysis uh, outside our institute somewhere else. And then uh, it recovered completely. She was sent to us only because they found some stones in her kidneys and thought that uh, she should get operated for that stone. And that's how it all began that when she came to us, the stones are sub centimeter small, non-obstructing stones, but the kidney one kidney was already uh, at 11 percent, and uh, that's why uh, um, okay. we did not operate her for the stone, but uh, put her on metaphylaxis, and the, the blood pressures were so high that we just went on with the management of blood pressure. So basically, we don't know the aldosterone level, but again, as Omar said that, it very was important to know because uh, we, if we, whether this patient belongs to primary hyperaldosterone with a very high uh, aldosterone and stress renin, or renin is high and that increases the aldosterone level or both renin and aldosterone both are low because that uh, those patients belong to all different category and with a different treatment. But whatever information we have uh, on this patient, I think the matter that after that thrombectomy, as a nephrectomy, our blood pressure did drop uh, significantly for some time. It tells us two things, whether that patient was, uh, that kidney was creating a very high level of renin, uh, and uh, also could be just because of the sympathetic, I mean, the nerves and the sympathetic nerve that has been disconnected and now the blood pressure dropped, but it came back. Uh, but you said there's no renal artery stenosis by angiogram on Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, on angiography, there, uh, on CT angiogram, there was no evidence of uh, stenosis. Okay. With HUS, we could have uh, suspected some micro uh, yeah. thrombotic yeah, micro, uh, micro angiopathy. Yes. But uh, that also we could not really find it. At, at, uh, Do you think the, the endothelial end. dysfunction is ongoing right now? You know, is, 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 is there a way to confirm that? Because um, uh, that, that may be the underlying etiology of what we are seeing st or we are still seeing. How is that driving the hypertensive response? It has to do it through the renin angiotensin axis system, mm -hmm. right? So it causes ischemia of the glomerulus, release of renin, and then upregulation. So we have to catch that. Um, you know, my suggestion is I think the data is obviously about five years into this illness at this time. So you probably need to mark territory again. First, define what is driving the the hypertension, um, and so you know, taking a look at the sodium excretion, the potassium excretion, and looking at the renin and aldosterone numbers is going to be key to start putting it into a box. Is this renin-dependent hyperaldosteronism or renal-independent hyperaldosteronism? And if we decide this is renin-independent hyperaldosteronism, uh, which more and more it is looking like, then we start thinking more in terms of um, um, a, hypo, a hyper -aldo state. And you know, one quick and dirty thing that we can do once you have, uh, once you have um, drawn the baseline labs, place them on aggressive um, sodium potassium blockade. Uh, so I would put them on an ARB and uh, you know, renal angiotensin aldosterone system blockade. So she's on an ARB. Is she on spironolactone or something at this point? Uh, yes, not not at this point, but we have tried it uh, along with the uh, um, nebulol, and then uh, we had also given her uh, uh, this um, combination pill, uh, the SGLT2 and the nebulol, uh, this one, Arnie. Arnie. Was amiloride ever tried? 
because it can cause that pseudo, you know, the ENAC is always on. And uh, I don't know if sometimes uh, serendipitously it helps with these patients. Uh, no, I don't think they have given amyloride uh, separately. Um, there is, uh, amyloride does not, uh, in Pakistan is not available as a separate drug. It comes in combination with Lasix as a laseride. I don't think we have tried that. Okay, one more time. Please tell me what exactly she is on now. She's on a um, uh, uh, minoxidil, right? Yes, she is I, on uh, enalapril, okay. losartan, ethinolol. These these are the medications before the surgery that she is already now on. And uh, along with that, she is now also on Arni and uh, this uh, SDLT. Okay. So first of all, I mean, uh, minoxidil, uh, the, I mean, the patient I described, she's on like a, so many medication. I didn't put her on a minoxidil for the being, reason being that uh, women don't like uh, minoxidil, uh, but here basically it's a life-threatening situation. She is, uh, she don't care whether she grows exactly. cold or not. Okay, so it's okay. But again, if you have to give minoxidil, this is a very small dose, okay, in my opinion, we have to give a higher dose. And I have patients who are minoxidil and they are at least 10 milligram twice a day. That you start with 2.5, no question about that. And it, if you have decided to treat, and it would reduce, uh, uh, you know, a pill burden on that. And along with that, you definitely had need uh, some beta blockers because it causes reflex tachycardia. And I think still uh, you have to go back if you can try. I don't know, benevolol was not effective at all because I, as Farouk showed, there is multi, uh, I think. Uh, multiple reasons in this patient, there must be some endothelial dysfunction of, after HUS, and which is actually could be reason. And the one drug which actually is effective in increasing nitroxide at endothelial level is uh, benevolol or biostolic. And you can go if her heart rate tolerates, so you go as high as it can. I mean, 20 milligram is very common dose we use, and it can go to 40 milligram. So I would put increased dose of minoxidil, increased dose of uh, uh, nebevolol, and definitely uh, diuretics with that. Uh, I mean, I know our GFR is much lower now, but still uh, chlorothalidone, it's not available there, right? So uh, works as well as GFR 20 and uh, uh, indepamide works as low as GFR of 30. Uh, so I will still uh, would try um, uh, uh, indepamide, um, mm -hmm. dose like five milligram on this patient. Um, see how she does with those uh, that combination. Uh, I don't see any benefit of uh, starting ACE inhibitor ARBs both together, even for blood pressure. What do you think, Infan? Uh, 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 yeah, Irfan, no, I mean, you, you share your approach. I will share my approach. I think we because we are all in data free zone. We we need to um, have some approach. I think this this patient. Um, well, this I is mean, life threatening. Yeah, I mean. I and, and to be honest, I think there is data, um, uh, and you know what, what we actually are doing is doing things in there. So what Avas has done is the first thing that you do when you look at refractory hypertension, and you look at all the medicines they're on, and then try to come up with the better versions of those medicines and the appropriate doses. So sometimes it's easy to call somebody on refractory, not the case here, but I'm just talking in generalities where they're on four medicines, but on small doses of four medicines. So that's not really refractory hypertension, right? So the, what if it, OAS is doing is, okay, how can I move the pieces on this board and optimize them? And that's good. The question is, she's on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven medicines in reasonable doses. We have to realize she's 14 years old, so she must be a small framed kid, right? So uh, this is not, I mean, if you gave me these medicines, I'd be in shock. So there's something not quite right here. There's something that's driving a very severe hypertensive response. So clearly we need to streamline some of these medicines and try to get the better versions of these. But I don't know if switching one beta blocker to another is going to drop our blood pressure from 180 by 120 to 120 by 70. So I don't think that's the definitive intervention that is required here. I think the first question to ask is why does this kid have such severe hypertension? I, I don't think we know the answer to this at this point. We've taken one kidney out. So if this was 
renin derived hypertension because of a scarred kidney, that should have been fixed. We now know that this is probably a renin independent process. The renin was reasonably suppressed. The aldosterone, I don't know what the number is, but in this particular case, if I found that the aldosterone was um, 10, right? And the renin was completely suppressed. You could make a case that that aldosterone is not completely suppressed. Um, so could this be a high aldo state? That's possible. So my approach to this would be to do some of the things that that um, um, that um, Aves was suggesting and adjust some of the medicines. Um, I would probably not double down on an ACE and ARB combination, but maximize one of them, probably the ARB. Um, and then what I would do is draw all the numbers again, get a renin, get an aldosterone. Um, and, and, uh, and Ali, if your lab is reporting the renin levels in picogram per ml, they may actually be um, reporting a plasma total renin level and not a plasma renin activity. The difference is the ratios are different, uh, different. You also want to see what is the test that your lab is using for the aldosterone level. Um, aldosterone can be measured two different ways. One is through an RIA, uh, and if you do that, uh, the levels are 25 to 30% higher than if you do it through LCMS. And most of the labs are not in the US at least, um, they, are, they, are turning into, they are turning into an LCMS based, uh, based regimen, I'm sorry, based uh, uh, methodology in the US and the levels are 25 to 30% low. Um, and the third thing is um, the aldosterone to renin activity ratios have a very, very poor positive and negative predictive value for a high hyperaldosterone um, state. Um, and so uh, essentially what you want to do um, is to do a couple of them. Now, money becomes important in Pakistan because it's easier for us to do two or three to kind of see what the trends are. But if you, get, if you could get two or three levels, that would be very helpful. Now, this kid's been sick for five years. Um, the only drug that you probably should not have on board when you're checking these levels is aldo, aldectone or phenylalanine or epilirinone, um, uh, and a, a sodium potassium blocker. Um, so if you could wait a, a week or so and get two snapshots at the renin and aldosterone level, and then... Mm -hmm. Uh, go on and start, um, you know, spinal lactone or something, you might see a response. Th that's how I would approach this uh, problem. But I don't take care of kids and kids are very difficult to take care of. So I will uh, bend to your wisdom on that. You have more experience in that. But if this was a little guy, a little girl, 19 year old, that's what I would do. With but I haven't seen any patient whose blood pressure is not controlled, any patient on minoxidil, it depends upon the dose. Any patient, I have not seen in my whole life. When you put minoxidil, it all depends upon your dose, that you dose and along with other medication. Uh, so probably you need to go on high dose minoxidil. You're absolutely right. We don't know exactly what is the cause and it's still workup need to be done. And after that, we'll have better idea of what will work for this patient. If you you still, she's good that she is not on a spiralectone or anything already. So it's easy to do the aldosterone at any level because you don't have to discontinue any other medication to have the aldosterone at any level. The problem with minoxidil is that it's not available in Pakistan and uh, this family could uh, get it only through Dubai and some relative oh, had sent okay. a box of it. So, so in that case, those I'm... are just 2.5 mg tablets. So they are, uh, what about uh, uh, what about uh, uh, amlodipine? She's not on that either, right? So high dose. She's amlodipine. on. Uh, amlodipine is our first first one. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't write it here. But yes, amlodipine is always there, ten milligrams twice a day. It looks like she's on diltiazem as well uh, for whatever that's. Worth. Yes. I mean, I don't think that will that's making any difference to diltiazem. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't think so. 
uh, atenolol has any role, I would take that off. I would put back on either carvedol if that is available or if uh, whenever pill. Carvedol is available, yes. Carvedol available, yeah. So atenolol is. And nebivalol also. Yeah, please put on nebivalol. Atenolol is absolutely useless for blood pressure, no role at blood pressure. And I would take the diltiazem also off. I mean, um, I would go higher on. Okay, Los, out of all the ARBs, my experience is that and the blood pressure hypertension community also has is. Uh, from experience that losartan is a useless ARBs for blood pressure as compared to other medication like losar, I mean, Valsartan. So if you have Valsartan or any other ARBs, put out that losartan 50 milligram is very low dose and it's not effective. Actually, if we have to give patient on ARBs, which we don't want blood pressure to go down, we put on losartan because he has all the other benefit of ARBs uh, for proteinuria or heart failure, uh, but not blood pressure. So I would change to Valsartan or something. I don't think patient will need an allopril at the same time. I would put on uh, benevolol, uh, 20 milligram. If the heart rate is slow, uh, doesn't go down. I would, uh, uh, if you have combination of uh, 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 endapamide and little bit dose Lasix and endapamide is not available, I would go on that. Uh, and I think because, uh, so you said uh, amyloroid is not available in Pakistan, amyloroid. Amyloroid separately is not available. It's available with LASIK. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I just said that. Okay, Laser. that uh, could be very effective on this patient, uh, even with LASIK, uh, because it will not interface your uh, test for uh, aldosterone or N level. So that's another way to go. Uh, but definitely, okay. yeah. So let me, you. my Thank recommendation, you much, to, uh, I would go on minoxidil, I would, I would DC antenol or deltaism, I would go higher dose, like 20 milligram of bevalol. Uh, and I will change from losartan to valsartan, whatever dose needs, like at 160 or 320. Uh, and uh, if you can add amyloroid, uh, in depamide, sorry, in uh, amyloroid also, somehow in combination or solely, that definitely will help. So um, let me share my approach and, and the way I'm thinking, and then we'll, we should have, I think, other opinions as well. It's like, so as Dr. Aga mentioned, we need to go back to drawing board, try to pinpoint what it is. 24-hour eldo, urine eldo level have helped too. I mean, I'm not sure it's based on the availability of the test, which test is um, uh, available. Uh, modality of treatment-wise, I would use whatever can slow down, block any step in the RAS system, all the way from, you know, the renin to eldo. I think the... Um, the aldactones are very important. Amyloride um, is always helpful. Uh, making sure that we are not dealing with this pheochromocytoma, cons, you know, those kind of things. Um, with the cre other adjustments, you know, you, you, you probably have a better handle on availability and, and different drugs. The other uh, very crazy question I have um, is that with the creatinine the way it is? So we assume. So, so let's assume this is um, uh, endothelial dysfunction, and then you know we are not using anything which is, you know, I don't think atrocentin, for example, is is, is has been approved for this indication. So if creatinine keeps rising, and now it has gone from two to three to four, um, at what point? Um, would you consider the nephrectomy and um, dialysis and transplant? Because it looks like this, this is like similar to a limb versus life situation. Is kidney the center house of hypertension? Um, and what's the probability that it, if you remove the second kidney or the adrenal on that side um, with it? I mean, is this too crazy of the idea of an idea? Uh, or not, or you know, you'll you'll cross that bridge once you reach there. So, so those are um, kind of you know really out of the box kind of ideas. Um, I'll stop here and see how does everybody react to it. I know I just uh, post a uh, very out of the box idea. I mean, I would not go and affect me on this patient. I would just uh, treat uh, and find out the, as a concept, find out what exactly causing that. Uh, this, and my feeling is that this has something to do with endothelial dysfunction. And out of all this medication uh, and nitric oxide uh, deficiency because of endothelial dysfunction, that's my feeling. And I think in that case, the bevel oil will be very beneficial, should be. 
Uh, but again, uh, we, we need to find out what's causing that. Uh, uh, we need to do aldosterone, and even if it's not done, um, plasma metanephrine level, I would do again. Uh, but we need to go to the bottom line, what causing that. So other opinions, um, Dr. Tarif, since you asked a lot of questions, sorry, I'm picking on you. Um, what would you do? One more question is, uh, do can they do, I mean, before we did nephrectomy on this patient, have the capability of doing a, a renal vein sampling? Could have done that? Uh, renal vein sampling for uh, renin and aldosterone? No, just for renin, renin level because of kidney just sampling. For renin. Yeah, for renal vein, well, she only has she only has one kidney so no before that before when they, they when they took it out i mean this could have been done uh, yeah we never thought of it we thought that well once she'll remove this kidney uh, she'll be all better never we could we so could ask me my it. u.s colleague i mean uh, uh Fawn and Umar, have you done any in effect for blood pressure or uh, ever yeah. I, I've done one, but it's a very, 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 very hard decision to make. Um, something, you know, blood pressures were in this range, but uh, very high renin levels, which we could not suppress with anything else. And it was a renin mediated hypertension and the kidneys were small and shrunken and the GFR was already close to 20. So, you know. Um, I mean, you have one shrunken kidney, you all have very high renin levels. So there's, I don't think that you have any choice and you don't have to do renal veins. But in this particular case, we don't even have high renin levels, or at least we are not sure if the renal levels were high. So to pin it on the kidney itself is a little bit hard. So I mean, if you're thinking this is renal parenchyma driven hypertension, we need to demonstrate that with high renin levels. Without that, you don't have a case. Yeah, I think, and I think there's a question in the chat as well. What if this patient is uh, has atypical HUS slash malignant hypertension? And I, I don't know if, Hina, you mean that remains dialysis dependent with uncontrolled blood pressure on multiple drugs? Um, um, I don't know if you, if you prefer to ask uh, or, or present your patient because you have a patient with more or less similar issues. Are you able that's to? Actually, that's actually not an unreasonable yeah. assumption uh, mm -hmm. because you know sometimes you do see very difficult to control hypertension in patients who've got um, some ongoing renal specific, uh, sorry, renal limited thrombotic microangiopathy, and you know, you know, at some point doing another biopsy is not unreasonable. Going back and taking a look at the kidney explant may actually help if there was pathology on that. If you found thrombotic microangiopathy on that explant, that might actually support this assumption. And any role in treatment of, you know, if you confirm the HUS would- If you, if you confirm renal limited HUS, the only thing that would make a difference is uh, ecolizumab. Also, after drawing, like if you plan to draw again the aldosterone level, after drawing the aldosterone level, I would put him back on uh, something like spirolactone. Why not? I mean, if your potassium is okay, if that is not the case. It's a challenging case. It is very, very challenging. <laughs> Kids are very, very. I, I don't I don't recall if Ali has ever presented a patient who is not super, super challenging. I think some of the I mean, unfortunately the patient they, he presented they, was also they, they so many quite difficult. They so sick no. with the limited, you know, that it's frustrating to treat uh, these kind of patients, but um here I, I think we got very good uh, um, feedback and you know. Once you uh, compile all these histories and then you can reflect better, uh, I can see myself too that now uh, we should uh, repeat these uh, renin aldosterone levels. We kind of, you know, we've gotten used to her coming to our uh, ward saying her head is hurting and we would give her something extra and, uh, that, uh, and as soon as her, uh, she starts feeling better, she wants to go home. And um, we've kind of given up on 
changing these medications. We have tried all of them in maximum doses. But now when you're and reflecting back on this management, I think myself also that there's a lot of room for us to change these things. Um, and there is a lot of duplication of these calcium channel blockers. We can uh, we have tried actually a combination pill that is the Triforge, which has Velsartan in it. The uh, amlodipine, Velsartan, and thiazide. So she was on Triforge for quite uh, some time. So, uh, but now we can go back to on that and maximize that. Remove the enalapril, remove the losartan, add the Lasix and amiloride and maximize the minoxidil. I had asked his, her brother to arrange minoxidil, more of minoxidil, because she was running out of it. And I was worried of uh, increasing the dose that she'll run out completely, and then we'll be, we won't be left with any. So uh, yes, uh, we've got some, some lead to- Is, a, is to hydralazine out. available in Pakistan? I'm sorry? Hydralazine. Yes, yes, it is. I just uh, prescribed somebody recently. Yes, so, it is. I know I you don't, don't like, like it. I, I don't like uh, that. But if you run out of minoxidil for the time being, you can I mean, change to... Uh, I, I share your hatred towards hydralazine, Dr. West. I know, but I, I don't like that being, medicine uh, at you, all. She runs out of minoxidil, but I mean, then you can put her on hydralazine for a few weeks. Uh, that should be okay, but not for long term. Has anyone ever used aliskarin? Like, what's that, Tecterna? Oh, it doesn't use, it's used as medication. No. It's used as too, okay. So, That's sorry. why it's not being marketed too much. I mean, now, I mean, it came and gone. I think the the, um, the spironolactones and um, those are, you, you definitely deserve a, a, a chance. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you don't need to need amyloride. And amyloride. You use a, definitely spironolactone instead if you, after drying the blood. Okay. Um, uh, I wish I could help more, but. I think I, I would withhold presenting my case after this presentation. And we are already at uh, almost at time. Maybe I can present my case next time. We are we want to stay in this hypertension um, and endocrine hypertension once once we present. I mean, it depends on the people. Are you can ask them. I mean, uh, if you want to, I mean, we can. No, right. let's let's keep it for next time. I'll, because then I can you know present some images as well. Um, okay, that might be helpful. I didn't prepare those images right now, so. I'll, I'll I'll come back with the follow up and uh, after oh, that'll uh, be great. You know, yes, because we all going to learn from and, 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 and I'll do and change the medications around and then I'll uh, keep I'll post it uh, on the group. What happened? Okay. Okay. Great. Anybody else has any um, questions? If not, then uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Masood for final comments since he's the presenter, and then uh, close the session. No, thanks for uh, very, I mean, thanks, but no thanks for presenting. Uh, I mean, I feel like that I, my knowledge is very limited. I mean, so with this tough case, uh, but hopefully with your recommendations, uh, let's try. Hopefully that will help this uh, young lady. Uh, uh, so thanks everybody for participating. And uh, hopefully we'll discuss more about this case and follow up and learn something from her case uh, in coming days. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Irfan, you want Irfan, to say something? Um, no, no, I, I just wanted to say thank you to Vess for a wonderful uh, talk and look forward to meeting everybody next time. Have a good rest of the day and Argentina finally, you know, so I'm sure everybody has seen that. Yeah, I'm getting so many, I mean, text messages regarding that, but. Thank you. Okay. Good night. All right. Thank you.